That's it's, the pumpkin I carved today. And I did the ears a little bit differently, but that's okay. I doubt anyone will notice. And James has pumpkin stew. He'll probably talk about some rock and roll again. And we're first gonna we're gonna, something. yeah, we're gonna go through a little bit of the wasteland. So it's, um, just a minute, I have to, well, I suppose I don't have to. I suppose I can leave it just as it is. It's just I forgot, to, well, I may as well make it a little higher. So, um, if you want to talk about the wasteland part two a little bit. Okay. Coat in soup. Well, I should have found the page for you, hey? Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's part two. Mm -hmm. There we the go. Waistline. That's a bit better. There are five parts. Mm -hmm. Not including the notes. The notes are substantial. Yep, no. there it is. Being of chess. So yeah, I I asked James if he could read uh, part two, a game of chess, because he he does a great job reading this stuff. Sometimes, sometimes. Well, yeah. we'll see. Kind of still trying to wake up and up most of the morning. Mm. And the meds on one hard sometimes to wake up, mm. but at least I keep on waking up. Yeah, that's the, the most important. Thing. Don't wake up. The Game of Chess, T.S. Eliot, published in 1922. The pieces of the poem, so-called poem, that uh, is called The Wasteland, were kind of composed presumably between 20 and when his last volume, the previous volume, before it was published, and 22 when The Wasteland was published. The Wasteland is really a Kind of like a dissected corpse of, uh, of well, actually, a, a corpse field of um, dissected corpses uh, that never really were brought to life. Um, they, um, they were kind of thrown together, I guess, at T.S. Eliot's behest by uh, an acquaintance of T.S. Eliot uh, called Ezra Pound. Came from maybe he was even born in Idaho. Yes, that's Idaho in the United States. The potato capital maybe of the North America. I wouldn't say the world. And uh, maybe just the United States. I think uh, Eastern Canada, the Maritimes, so, would perhaps have a claim to the North American throne. A game of chess. So this one has a little bit more. Um, Coherence, although what I can, from what I can see, it's maybe um, three, two or three poems scrunched together. And uh, you know, when you look at Ezra Pound's editorial comments, one of his favorite ones was, is one of my least favorite ones, too penty. In other words, too much, too much like pentameter. I am presumably. I am. That's on the, I actually looked at some of the, maybe most of the original manuscripts that were plunked in Ezra Pound's lap. And I won't say that they're necessarily better than the stuff in, guaranteed better stuff than what made it into the wasteland, but oftentimes those kind of working copies were better than what Ezra Pound did. He's, he cut and slashed, and he's like a, a uh, Anthony Hopkins, whatever, you know, in the Silence of the Lambs, um, pretending to be a plastic surgeon or something like mm -hmm. that. Did you see that movie? Or yeah. Was he a slasher type? I've never seen the movie. I've just heard about it or something like that. Sil Apparently. In Silence of the Lambs, hmm. he didn't... Well, he, I guess he... His, you mean the... Anthony Hopkins yeah, character. Yeah, sure. The bad guy. Well, he did. Well, he wasn't the bad guy in *The Silence of the Lambs*. He was a bad guy. But there but are other bad guys. Yes. Are... You need to watch *The Silence of the Lambs*. Apparently, so well. he was um, 
one of the bad guys, and and he did end up killing some people. Well, there you go. If you haven't seen Silence of the Lambs, I guess. Spoiler alert, eh? Well, man, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I won't uh, spoil it for me one way or another. Honestly, he doesn't, um, he's not, I mean, it's gruesome, but it's actually quite sensible. And so I would say it's, um, he wasn't, uh, it, it's not like he was doing um, what he did to be gruesome. It was a necessity to. It was well planned. So anyway, yeah, so uh, it's uh, apparently that character is based partly on uh, a real life character. Really? Yeah, slightly below average intelligence, uh, but uh, Gein, I think his name was G E I N, mm. and uh, came from kind of in the north central United States, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe North Dakota. So did he eat people too? Well, um, the uh, it's partly based. Uh, I think a better. I, I was reading a book about uh, some serial killers and stuff like that. It, it gave a review of it, and uh, they said uh, that a real life character was used as a partial basis for Anthony Hopkins' character in Silent Night. Huh. But even more importantly, the Anthony Perkins character in. Um, Really? It's that one about the motel. Because they don't seem Hufford. at all alike. I think they're kind of making it up about the Anthony Hopkins thing. That okay. The Anthony Perkins thing is incredible. Because the guy, his mom died. He preserved his mom's body or something like that. Uh, he'd kill, well, originally he'd be robbing graves, which is not in the, whatever movie that is by Alfred Hitchcock. And glitching on Psycho. The Psycho. And uh, he was robbing graves, and he was skinning women, uh, women's corpses, and dressing up in their skins and stuff. Okay, like that. yeah, that's not. You see, if you had watched Silence of the Lambs, you would know it wasn't Anthony Hopkins' character that he was basing that on. It was the other guy. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Uh, uh, so. <laughs> so now I just gave more away. Well, about there you Silence go. Of okay. <laughs> anyway, a game of chess. There we go. And it was a quite, quite a gruesome uh, case, and he did eventually, uh, I guess the graveyard was running out of corpses. And, oh my uh, gosh. So he started killing women. Yeah. At least one, he killed at least one. Uh, the chair she sat in, like a burnished throne, glowed on the marble where the glass held up by standards wrought with fruited vines, from which a golden cupidon peeped out, another hid his eyes behind his wing, doubled the flames of seven-branched candelabra, reflecting light upon the table as the glitter of her jewels rose to meet it from satin cases poured in rich profusion. In vials of ivory and colored glass, unstoppered, lurked her strange synthetic perfumes, unguent, powdered, or liquid. Troubled, confused, and drowned the scents and odors, stirred by the air that freshened from the window, these ascended in fattening the prolonged candle flames, flung their smoke into the lacquey area, stirring the pattern on the coffered ceiling, huge on the coffered ceiling. Huge seaweed fed with copper, burned green and orange, framed by the colored stone, in which sad light a carved should have said carved dolphin swam. Above the antique mantle was displayed as though a window gave upon the sylvan scene the change of filament by the barbarous king so rudely forced. Yet there, the nightingale filled all the desert with inviolable voice, and still she cried, and still the world pursues jug jug to dirty ears, and other withered stumps of time were told upon the walls. Staring forms leaned out, leaning, hushing the room enclosed. Footsteps shuffled on the stair. Under the firelight, under the brush, her hair spread out in fiery points, glowed into words, then would be savagely still. My nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. What are you thinking of? What thinking? What? I never know what you are thinking. Think. I think we are in Rat's Alley where the dead men lost their bones. What is that noise? The wind under the door. What is that noise now? What is the wind doing? Nothing. 
again nothing. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? I remember. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head? But oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag. It's so elegant, so intelligent. What shall I do now? What shall I do? I shall rush out as I am and walk the street with my hair down so. What shall we do tomorrow? What shall we ever do? The hot water at ten. And if it rains, a closed car at four. And we shall play a game of chess, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. When Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, and in midst my words, I said to her myself, hurry up, please, it's time. Now Albert's coming back, make yourself a bit smart. He want to know what you'd done with that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. He did. I was there. You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set, he said. I swear I can't bear to look at you. And no more can't I, I said, and think of poor Albert. He's been in the army four years. He wants a good time. And if you don't give it him, there's others will, I said. Oh, is there, she said. Something of that, I said. Then I'll know who to thank, she said. And give me a straight look. Hurry up, please, it's time. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't. But if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. You ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique, and her only 31. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. She said five already, and nearly died of young George. The chemist said it'd be all right, but I've never been the same. You are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What you get married for if you don't want children? Hurry up, please, it's time. Well, that Sunday, Albert was home. They had a hot gammon, and they asked me into dinner to get the beauty of it hot. Hurry up, please. It's time. Hurry up, please. It's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night. Ta-ta. Good night. Good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. So there's at least three parts, uh, two parts. Uh, I, I would say the part where there's a, a it sounds like a woman, presumably uh, based on T.S. Eliot's then wife, who's, uh, it starts off with, my nerves are bad tonight, it's in quotation marks, and then uh, presumably T.S. Eliot, someone based on him, he would argue that uh, it wasn't really him, <laughs> come on, anyway, where I was reading in a deeper voice, I think we're in rats' alleys, where the dead men lost their bones, so it's kind of like a dialogue, but the only spoken part of the dialogue is the woman's part and then the man's part is just what he's thinking not really answer and it's a little bit in that way like uh, we read a while portrait back of a lady. portrait of a lady where uh, the woman is a very different personality mm -hmm. um, and although there is a repetition in that one too mm -hmm. but uh, the character that uh, is based, I think, pretty close on T.S. Eliot's character. Is I don't know. He, he, there is one thing. Let us take the air in the tobacco trance. I'm not sure whether he actually said that. It might be. Let us take the air. And then he's thinking in a tobacco trance. He might not have been even. Excuse me, saying out loud. Just thinking. And then uh, so there's a uh, ironic kind of like asides, but you. They're called the sides of drama, where the person's actually thinking. And then uh, there's the third thing, which is kind of like a, a, not so much a dialogue, but maybe a monologue with a chorus. And the chorus is not a group of people, as you'd have in classic uh, drama, but it would, it's presumably a barkeeper or something like that. I had a male voice. I guess it, nowadays it could be a woman. Yeah, like, hurry up, please, it's time. Presumably closing time. So it's a monologue, basically, in a bar or something like that, uh, very much in English kind of style, and I, I could imagine a woman saying a lot of the stuff, and 
the way it said. I think it's a woman. It's kind of getting a little bit chatty. And more than a little gossipy, I suppose, about her, uh, Lil, her friend Lil, or acquaintance, something like that. Frenemy. Anyway, uh, it's generally quite done. I see the. There's not really uh, much. I don't know if there's much poetic organization in the last two thirds. Uh, it's more like um, what some people call free verse. I would call it um, maybe poetic prose. The uh, first it tends to be quite penty. The chair she sat in like a burnished throne. So I am big pent Glowed on the marble where the glass sat. So I am only a big tetrameter with a trochaic substitution in what's called the first foot. Held up by standards wrought with fluted vines. That's iambic pentameter again with a trochaic substitution for the first am, uh, first foot. In which a golden cupidon peeped out. That seems to me to be iambic pentameter. Another hit his eyes behind his wing. Iambic pentameter. So it's uh, it's largely iambic pentameter and uh, pretty well most of it. Uh, Footsteps shuffle on the stair. That's iambic pentameter with a missing. Well, and I like seven. that he did that. Or, well, I, or I suppose that Ezra Pound allowed that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, as if. Yeah. Because it actually makes sense mm -hmm. because it seems like it's more organized at the beginning and then it gets to be less so, right? And so it kind of gives you the idea that things are falling apart. Things fall apart. The center. Oh, that's Will Butler Yates. Almost exactly the same time. I wonder when that was. That's called the Second Coming. And it was, I'm pretty sure, in the wake of the Russian Revolution. A lot of uh, left wingers see that as a much about it as a will, but we did see it as being a portent of fashion. <laughs> no. And well, William Butler also, Yeats actually sympathized with the Nazis. I mean, the, the beginning fascists. part is basically. Um, the poet describing the scene and 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 stuff like that, right? So it's in his mind, on the paper, and then she's interrupting that flow with her. Yeah, I don't know how right, realistic so. the scene is. I think it is actually kind of realistic, and so in some ways, although it's You're very. You're losing your stew. Oh. Off the side. Oh, there we go. <laughs> anyway, I was trying not to lose it from one side, but I was losing it on the other. Robbing from Peter to pay Paul, as it's known. Anyway, it's um, it really is a, a scene setting, very long one and quite poetic one. Mm -hmm. And very it's also interesting yeah. because he ended up writing plays, and you can get the feel that he's moving in that direction. So well, he had uh, even in uh, something like uh, it's the first two poems of his oeuvre uh, in, in order as published Portrait of a Lady and before it a love song of J.F. for Prufrock they have a strong sense of what my uh, stupid instructor uh, destructor whatever you want to call them in creative writing uh, called voice so um, his idea was you had your own voice and uh, you didn't really mess around with other stuff what you image and voice that's what it came down to Poetry, you know, a voice is basically. Sing it again. You may as well eat a few spoonfuls, or you're just gonna keep it. Um, trying to talk. I don't want to be. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, so I'm just trying to be useful while I'm. You talk. are useful. Okay. Anyway, um. Uh, How would I read these notes? While you well, I'm, I'm just uh, want to finish up this. Oh. Idea about voice. You know, like, the, you're going to have a voice. <laughs> you know, it, it might be mewing if you don't have much personality or if you don't have much artistry or whatever. You're always going to have a voice. Your own poetry. The key is capturing other people's voices. So this guy was, you know, like, it, it, it was like begging the question. You know, like, I like this because it has a voice. No, he liked it because it was free verse. 
like William Carlos Williams. What sort of voice does uh, the red wheelbarrow have? It's about as flat as a pancake. You know, like what was he really like, William Carlos Williams? Was, uh, you know, like, I can't imagine him being that flat. So much depends on, so much depends on the red wheelbarrow. By the white chickens glazed with rain, no, by the red, glazed with rainfall or whatever, rain, uh, by the white chickens or whatever. <laughs> wow! Okay, uh, go with your notes. Okay. So, I, my notes, as I mentioned before with the others, I hadn't, when I was making my notes, I hadn't um, planned on actually reading them, so I don't know if they'll make any sense whatsoever. Gold Cupid. Much reflection and glittering. Green and orange. Philomel raped by the king. Beauty then ugly. My nerves. What his wife would have been saying. Those are pearls. Her breakdown. Insanity was really stressing him out. And I think his wife uh, had I think a breakdown. Uh, him and as a, a fairly poet, serious really. breakdown. I'm afraid it mm -hmm. did. She, I don't think, ever recovered from it. And sadly, in another way, at least he was able to write plays. plays, and you know, got huge recognition. Sure. I think the Wasteland is considered the ultimate modernist poet poem in the English language. You know? And well, this one, this one's a good one. Uh, this part. It's part to of it. It's actually, it. I don't know, really I'd say it's two different what he's poems. Going through. You know, just and what his wife together. is going through. So, yeah. I'm telling you, I had a, well, a sister who was schizophrenic. Some people think she was manic depressive, didn't show the typical signs of manic depression. Wasn't that creative. She mom thought that she was the brightest of us all, even brighter than me. I was surprised when she said that, because uh, my other siblings say, oh, you were, you were, to me, uh, you were her favorite, and she thought you were the brightest and that sort of stuff, but she actually said to me, she figured uh, at the beginning my sister was brighter than me. But eventually, like her IQ tests were just all over the map, and that would be depending on how stressed, how stressed she was. Out she was sure. But uh, I don't think they went much over 120, and that was significantly lower than all but one of my siblings. Significantly lower. Could have been higher than mine. I don't know. Never taken an IQ test, and I'm not interested because I'm not interested in other people defining what I'm capable of. I think IQ is a very flexible thing, as we saw with my sister. I think the lowest she tested was, what did it go as low as 105? But anyway, um, Charlie Manson tested, uh, apparently, when he hit the jail system. Well, not hit the jail system. Before he started reading books, because he was a juvenile offender. And spent time in institutions, as a result. And, um, but he discovered books prison library and all of a sudden he went from being apparent below average in other words two figures two three figures how high 130 or higher some people say that's genius level I think that's maybe overestimating um, so what's the point of an IQ test if a person just by reading a few books probably fairly superficially also then can go up 30 30 percent or more uh, maybe uh, uh, by a whole third 33 percent uh, anyway not going to have other people define what I'm capable of because that's the whole idea was like oh, that's kind of like fixed carved in stone as it were as though your brain was some sort of stevie or something like that anyway what were we talking about you were talking about how your sister used to go walking. Yeah, well, it's, she, the, much of that stuff could have just been taken right out of her script. You know, what are you thinking? Are you thinking? You know, like, what? <laughs> what am I thinking? I, I don't know. I, you know, like I'd be sitting there quietly, you know, and she, she'd want to talk, you know, and 
be challenging and stuff like that you know and that was it wasn't just one time it was often what are you thinking now you know, and you could tell that she'd want some sort of happy news you know but I'd be sitting there kind of like when you're thinking about stuff or not thinking or whatever you don't you don't really have a smile on your face you don't really have a frown on your face it's just it's whatever and uh, it was I felt okay I'm kind of being put on the spot I have to come up with some sort of rationale for her being not so down or whatever at that point in time she hadn't been diagnosed or anything like that I could, I could remember there was something wrong with her even as a kid so when I was reading about the biography of John John Nash the so-called Nobel Prize it's not really the Nobel Prize for economics that was created later not one of the original Nobel Prizes I don't think it's even given by the Nobel Institute or whatever it's called in Sweden but uh, yeah, I think it's for economics but his work on uh, game theory and John Nash but they they were saying John Nash was schizophrenic and I'm not so sure because he actually chief stuff he was definitely upset. I'd say he was maybe manic depressive. But uh, I mean, these things do di get misdiagnosed. Uh, there was one psychiatrist or whatever you want to call him, psychologist, who was diagnosing Brian Wilson as being schizophrenic. And Brian Wilson's obviously this is the Beach Boys fame, obviously manic depressive or bipolar. Uh, hopefully, he's getting treatment for that sort of stuff, uh, even as we speak. You go, Brian Wilson. You one of the best ever of all time. Anyway, um, uh, she, uh, they, in John Nash's biography, you see it, uh, he bit, I think it was one of his siblings on the back and wouldn't let go of one. I'm going, wow, that's what my sister did to me. She was four years younger than me. I couldn't do anything about it. You know, I, 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 when, uh, you, this was in Regina, so I would have been between the ages of five and eight. When your sister's four years younger than we'll say it was more towards the end, eight years old, but she's four years old, and I couldn't get her off my back, and it was hurting. She was hammering down on my back. And I was checking with another one of my sons, I just mentioned, he said, yeah, she did the same thing to me. And he's 